So as um, Brandon mentioned just now, I've been involved in some data mesh work recently. And um, through that, I've been in a few conversations where um, I noticed this puzzle of, okay, I, I like the idea of data mesh, but how do I ensure quality across this mesh? Um, and I think a, a, an oversimplification of that concern is prior to this, I have a central team who was um, managing to, to put all the data in the data lake. Now um, I need to do this in a decentralized fashion. So how do I still ensure quality in this decentralized world? So then I kind of consolidate a point of view based on my experience working with data products and backend services and so on. And then I noticed a bit of interest from other teams. Um, and so that is the same point of view that I'm playing, that I'm planning to share today in 15 minutes. So it's going to be quite ambitious. We will be covering types of tests, how they could be useful um, for different types of data products um, and how they could look like in an overall data mesh ecosystem. Uh, for many of you who are coming from a software development background, uh, I think a lot of these techniques are going to look pretty familiar. Um, but anyway, what I'm aiming for is that after 15 minutes, um, you can come out with an aspirational or sort of what it looks like, um, and you can adjust it to your journey um, and to your needs. One thing to call out is because of time limitation, I'll be limiting the scope of this discussion to the techniques and not so much on the tooling. Okay, with that, let's go with a quick recap on the types of data products that we often see. Um, so on the far left here, we have source online data products that typically expose data from source systems in a way that is uh, close to how the source system itself typically represents data. So there's not a lot of loss of fidelity, if any. Um, and then on the far right, we have fit for purpose data products, which expose data that's modeled to, to serve a specific use case, typically in a performant way. And then um, in the middle, we have aggregate data products. There can be multiple layers of these, um, and they expose aggregates uh, in the DDD sense, or just generally three, five domain concepts, while also, if needed, abstracting away the source systems that they're getting it from. Um, each of these data products are going to encapsulate more than just data, as many of you uh, are familiar with. They're going to, you're going to encapsulate some transformation, typically in the form of code, uh, data, as well as some policy. Uh, and he, here I'm using the word policy in a pretty broad sense. So in terms of uh, security policy, and then SLOs like timeliness that you want to um, adhere to or um, comply with in your data product. Um, there's a bit of a side note here as well. Uh, there's a common mis misconception that data in the data mesh ecosystem should flow linearly. So from a source line data product, to an aggregate data product, um, and then to a fit for, purpose, fit for purpose data product, and that's the only way it can flow. Uh, but that's not quite, there's no rule that says that. Um, so any of these products are actually products in their own right. They are consumable directly in their own right. Just depends on how, um, what kind of transformation you need before uh, you need to consume it. Uh, but because they are all products in their own right, um, the teams that are responsible for the, them are uh, product teams. So they are responsible for the quality of the data that they expose, not just to simply expose the data. So this is a very simple principle, but one that kind of underlies uh, the rest of the discussion today. So that sounds good, but, but then how can they go about this? Um, so we'll get to that next. We'll get to the testing bits. Um, and I'm um, going to do this in two, ch two chapters. So first we'll, we are going to zoom in to a single data product. And for a moment, we're not going to think too much about what type of data product it is, just a sort of a generic one that has some transformation in it and exposing some data. Um, and then secondly, we will zoom out and look across a mesh that, cons that could consist of multiple different um, types of data products, just like we just uh, spoke about. Okay. So um, first looking at a single data product here, a bit of a busy slide, but uh, code goes from left to right in its journey to production. Um, so on the developer machine, there are a few tests that um, would be useful for data engineers to run. Um, these are unit tests and component tests. Both of them are used to test transformations on that data product, uh, of course, at different levels. 
So unit tests would be sort of at function level uh, when you have a function in Spark, for example, that transforms one data frame to another. Um, and then the component one will be more operating on a data pipeline or job level. Um, and just like um, developers on any other uh, sort of software system, so there's microservice or, or whatever, uh, the developer should run these locally, but then these tests should also be run in the CI CD pipeline as well. Um, and for these tests, we can use mock data that is representative of the known scenarios that the transformation should be able to handle. And then all the way to the right in production, uh, we have a different focus. Here, we want to get visibility over the data that we are actually exposing. Um, and this is so that we can find out how good of a job you're doing or how we should improve. The first technique to call out here is data quality tests. These are tests, they are plugged into the data pipelines or orchestration layer uh, to be run at, well, typically at the runtime of that transformation at the, at the end. Um, so they look something like uh, the field age, for example, should contain values between zero to 120. Um, and field start date of a project subtask, for example, um, should be on or after uh, the parent tasks uh, start date, um, or, or some ID should be unique, and so on. Um, so this is where you can codify a few things. Uh, one, you can codify, as a data product team member, your own expectation of what, uh, what sort of quality should be enforced in the data that you're exposing. Um, and this can be really quite detailed, like, like we were uh, talking about at field level. Um, you can also codify, secondly, the business domain SME's expectation. Um, and ideally, of course, uh, your team, the data product team, should be working closely with the business domain SME. Uh, but you can more formally, um, ideally, put their expectations um, in this test as well so that you can verify that you're always meeting them. And the other thing, um, last but not least, is the expectation from your data product consumers. Uh, different consumers, just like, again, in, in other types of systems, uh, would care about different things. So some of them would probably care about a particular like location field, for example, more so than a date field. Um, and that could be different uh, for another consumer. All right, so um, this is uh, opinion alert. Um, I think if you can only run this in one environment because of cost reasons or you're just starting out, uh, I would recommend that you run this in production so that you're not running blind in production. Uh, I've seen a few cases where this wasn't in place in production and people think that everything's great. Um, but of course there are still issues and it's just that they are detected much later by the data consumers. So by tickets or emails uh, and it's, it's often, if it's really a lot better, right? If the data product team can detect issues uh, by themselves, it's going to improve the trustworthiness of the data. So then moving on to the other box just south of that, there is a related technique called data profiling, which um, at its essence is things like min, max, standard deviation, completeness, uniqueness. So a few generic measures that can be applied regardless of what uh, data product, what data you're exposing in a data product. So there's no pass fail, it's just really stating the profile of the data in a summary fashion. Um, and these are cheaper to start with uh, because of how generic they are. And they can be used either as a stepping stone um, to more quality checks um, or also actually as a complement to the data quality checks that we spoke about earlier. Um, so one of my teams that didn't have data quality checks yet, uh, we use our data profiling in product to troubleshoot. Uh, we found that, I, this was uh, a couple of years ago, so I don't remember all the specifics, but uh, through our data profile, we found that, that for a few days, there's been uh, a bit of an increase in nulls um, in a particular field that we were outputting. And also, luckily, our upstream data product had data profiling set up as well. So we can uh, check theirs, and then we can see um, if the problem was on their side or from our side. Um, so it, this is something that is helpful on its own, uh, but if you can do data quality checks on top of that, uh, that's going to be uh, more helpful as well. Um, another technique um, here is anomaly detection. Um, so this is for 
um, seeing anomalies, keeping historical context in mind. Um, uh, a case that would be helped by this that I heard recently is uh, in one of our clients, there are some sales numbers that are feeding reports um, and the sales numbers um, went up by something like 200% overnight. Then this wasn't like in a Black Friday or something like that where that would be expected. Um, and this wasn't detected uh, by anything um, automated. It was like, it was reported by the client. But anomaly detection would, of course, help with detecting something like this. Um, so that would be useful in cases like that. Another case that where this could help is when, and this is happening in, in another um, account, uh, they, were my, they are migrating some of the underlying legacy source systems to newer ones. And some of these migrations are big bang. And they want to use uh, the aggregate data products as as a way to abstract away all these underlying legacy system migration from uh, downstream data consumers. So anomaly detection could ensure that when that big bang migration is happening, um, the downstream data consumers of these aggregate data products are actually not seeing anything different. All right, um, I think that means that we can move on to pre-production environment uh, that we conveniently skipped just now. So data quality checks, data profiling, and anomaly detection. Um, again, if you can run it in one environment only for some reason, um, I would suggest that you run it in production. But of course, if you really need to lower the risk of detecting bad data in production, then you can do it earlier in your pre-production environments. But you will need to do it with production-like data. And uh, as many of you know, that is not without cost. So there is definitely a trade-off there. Um, of course, if your data is sensitive, you'll have to either anonymize it or, or go with synthesized data so that you don't have that, um, you don't have PII uh, lying around in a pre-production environment for everyone to see. Um, and you may also want to run, you may also want to have a subset of production data because otherwise, if your job takes uh, many hours to run in production, you're not going to get much earlier feedback if you don't have a subset of that data. Uh, but then if you take a subset, uh, you need to make sure that you have some uh, statistically representative sample of the production data so that you can actually trust the feedback that your pre-production tests um, are giving you. So uh, what about these other two things? Uh, flow tests and exploratory tests. Um, exploratory tests, um, they are useful in pre-production environments to catch quality issues that are not yet automated. So this is literally some manual um, exploring. It can be um, running a few queries by hand, looking at the data manually, seeing if anything catches your attention. Um, or you can look at the data profile, of course, to see if there's been any worrying trends. Um, and this can be used not just for functional testing, of course, but also for cross-functional testing. Um, as an example, this would be um, looking into the logs, for example, and making sure that you don't, you're not seeing any PII getting logged um, in those. So um, as much as possible, once you've found an issue this way, you should then put an automated test to catch it next time. Right, so can you, you can move on to more interesting issues. Um, and then another one to call out um, that could be useful is flow test. So in a similar vein to unit tests and component tests, these are uh, for testing transformations but they have a broader scope than unit and component test. Um, so if you have a data product that is a bit more um, complicated and it, it requires a fair bit of orchestration, um, this is where you can use, uh, this is what you can use to test that. So for less complicated data products, uh, it's just basically component test. You don't need a separate kind of test. Okay, um, so now zooming out. Um, on the left here, we have the source line data products, we use, which we, um, uh, refreshed just a, a few slides ago. These transformations for source land data products are often, although not always, simpler. Uh, and because they are usually simpler, uh, the tests on transformations are usually a little less useful. Uh, and so that's what the graying out here means. It doesn't mean don't do it. It means they may be a little bit less useful, but then again, if that depends. Um, so instead, we can focus more on the data quality checks so that we can ensure that the data that flows downstream from the source uh, online data products are going to be good enough. 
the data quality issues are spotted here, especially uh, when there's minimal transformation should ideally be fed back as improvements to the source systems uh, themselves. Um, and then other things like exploratory tests, they are still useful. Um, and again, as, um, when you find issues there, you need to um, try to automate it after as much as possible. For the other two, aggregate data products and for purpose data products, all the techniques that we discussed before are still applicable um, after prioritizing to your needs. Um, so then now with these techniques, each data product should then achieve a certain level of quality in isolation. But how about how they work together? Because uh, they are going to depend on each other. So that's where this stuff comes in uh, between any data product, consumer and producer pair. And here the visual is simplified a bit because again, any data product can technically consume any other data product. Uh, here I'm simplifying it, just kind of showing the linear fashion, but that's not necessarily the case. Uh, but two things to call out here. The first one is that they should collaborate on data quality checks. So the consumer and the producer in any one of these pairings. The consumer should collab should communicate their quality expectations. And then the producer should make sure that they do deliver on those expectations. So this helps avoid a completely puristic pursuit uh, for data quality. Having said that, as we sort of covered before too, uh, data product team should have enough domain knowledge to also have their own expectations of quality of the data that they're exposing. All right, the next technique here uh, that I'm calling out is schema contract test. This is going to help minimize the impact to downstream consumers when an upstream data product is changed or evolved in terms of schema. Um, so unlike in developing RESTful services where a contract test covers expectations of both schema and data for various scenarios, here I'm making a little bit of a distinction. Uh, so for any data quality expectations that was in the previous box, and then uh, this one here is a bit more specifically covering schema changes or schema expectations. So this could be as simple as, hey, data producer, I am a consumer of data product. These are the fields that I care about. If you're going to change these, you're going to affect me. And this, you can say these are my expectations on the data type as well. Um, so similar to microservices, when it fails, it's going to trigger a conversation between the producer and the consumer. Did it fail because the consumer changed something or did it fail because the producer changed something? So with that, we've covered a fair bunch of techniques for um, testing functional stuff. So the transformation and the data itself. Uh, but how about cross-functional concerns? Um, so of course you can have cross-functional tests um, as needed. Some can be at a mesh level or a subset of it as in uh, across a few data products, some at individual data product level. Uh, so I'm just covering, okay. I think this is a sign that I'm getting close to or maybe have uh, gone through um, a lot of time, I'm going to try to finish up real quick, uh, but there can be a few different types of uh, uh, cross-functional tests. You can have performance tests, security, timeliness monitoring, um, and again, you can have this um, running automatically in your as part of CRC pipeline as well. And then governance, that is a big topic by itself, but if we just talk about the computational part of it, and if you if you've read the article, you would have uh, seen the term federated computational governance. Um, so the brief thing that I want to mention here is um, you can have many of these tests. Again, some of them are going to be um, cross-functional, like security or, or um, so something like that, that that needs to be enforced across multiple different data products. Um, we, this is a technique for us to ensure that um, there are there is some um, conformance, but also that um, otherwise the individual data product teams are going to have uh, autonomy. Um, okay, so I guess that completes our, our quick tour. Uh, we started by zooming into a generic data product and then we zoomed out uh, to cover how it looks like um, within the mesh and covering cross-functional tests and very, very briefly governance. And that is what I have for today. So thank you and enjoy the rest of the day.